silence. Mm -hmm. I like silence. Okay, folks, I think we can get started. Um, first of all, I want to thank you for um, attending tonight. This is the second night of a three-night symposium on gun violence in America. And uh, he's not here tonight, but I want to uh, recognize Dr. Frank Connor, who is the uh, chair of the psychology department here at GRCC, who really uh, started this process and started the conversation, and that led to uh, what you're going to see tonight. Um, he actually presented last night on the psychology of a mass shooter. Tonight's going to be a little bit different. We have four panelists um, with you tonight. My name is Mike Light. I'm the chair of the social science department. All four of these folks represent different disciplines within the social science department. We have uh, Dr. Bob Hendershot, who teaches history here at the college. Dr. Dylan Carr, who teaches anthropology and archaeology. Uh, Professor Gordon Verusich, who teaches political science. And Dr. Lisa Glegg, who teaches economics. They're all going to approach the issue of the, the Second Amendment and the, the current debate around the Second Amendment from their own discipline-specific perspectives, probably talking for about 10 or 15 minutes each, um, and then we'll open it up for questions. What we really hope is that this is more of a dialogue. If you guys have questions, we would like you to be able to ask them and then have them address those questions. Um, and you can certainly have a conversation with each other as well. The one thing I'm going to ask is I have a couple of microphones. We like to film this, and the only way that we can capture the questions on videotape is if you use the microphone. So if you use, Order. if you have a question, just raise your hand, and I'll come around with a microphone, and you can state your question into the microphone. It's not like it's um, karaoke night or anything, so there's no pressure. It's not a big deal. If you have a question, just feel free to ask away. Okay? I'll let them get started. I think we're going to start with Dr. Hendershot. It could be karaoke night. Just saying. What would you like to sing? Oh, bad, bad Leroy Brown, maybe, if there's time. Okay, so, again, my name is Bob Hendershot. I teach history here at the Grand Rapids Community College, and I've been asked tonight to focus some of my remarks at the start about the history of this debate around the Second Amendment. First of all, can everyone hear me okay? Am I right for level in the back? Excellent. All right, so the Second Amendment's a fascinating topic, right, especially in the last 30 or 40 years. And often the rhetoric of the modern debate centers around the language of this amendment and how we should interpret it or not here in the 21st century. And of course, the language itself is fascinating in that it describes a well-regulated militia. Um, and it's an interesting piece to, to think about. It's not the most clear piece of writing ever completed in the English language. The Second Amendment reads, a well-regulated militia being necessary to the security of a free state, the right of the people to keep and bear arms shall not be infringed. As far as what its authors were thinking at the time, in the 1780s, when the Republic was young, um, this is not a controversial topic. I mean, it's pretty clear what they were thinking in the early republic. They were enlightenment figures. They were enlightenment thinkers. And of course, their language, the people, is ubiquitous in the era of revolution, meaning a democratic government. We, the people, right, references a form of political organization opposed to monarchy. But the focus, of course, the actual subject of the sentence is in the first clause, right, the well-regulated militia. And it goes on to talk about, you know, the necessity for the security of the country, right, for them to have arms. It does not, in the language itself, reference individual citizens. It does not talk about guns. It talks about a well-regulated militia's necessity for the security of the country and its need to have arms. Well, anyway, when you place it in historical context, again, in the era of the very early republic here in the 1780s, the young United States had very little by way of a standing army. And it was highly dependent upon a body of uh, a militia of citizen soldiers, as it had been in the Revolution. And in the early republic, right, the, 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 the amendment was to guarantee the security right of the country by maintaining such a militia in the case of several scenarios that created a high degree of paranoia amongst the early Americans, right, the early American citizens, right? For example, if the British should reinvade, they need such a regulated militia, right, with access to arms. If the slaves should rise up, 
right? They needed a well-regulated militia to crush such an insurrection as they had seen recently in places such as Haiti and throughout the American South on several occasions. And then finally, of course, looming like a specter over much of life in the young republic was you know, the possibility that Native Americans would attempt to reassert their control over the land base. And once again, a well-regulated militia was the young country's main armored defense. So placed in historical context, and this is what we see with that amendment, right? The dependence upon citizen soldiers who could be called up right by the country. Time passed, the nation grew up, it grew larger, more populous, and its problems changed. Eventually the British did reinvade and, and we survived that. Um, but as I say, it expanded, the Industrial Revolution happened, and soon no longer was the United States an agrarian nation of yeoman farmers and their slaves. It became an industrialized country uh, with industrialized problems. As it reached the status of not just a regional power but a global power towards the dawn of the 20th century, the United States had developed a much larger standing professional army. The National Guard right, is the evolution of those early militias, but beyond that, a centralized, federally controlled army and other branches of the military. The ideology and necessity behind the Second Amendment became antiquated. The role of a well-regulated militia of citizen soldiers was no longer the linchpin of American security that it once was. And a long time passed, and for actually, it's, it's, it's surprising to think about, given the, the, the state of discourse in current America, in modern day America, it's interesting to think about how a long time passed, and for much of the 20th century, indeed for the bulk of the 20th century, the Second Amendment was actually not a hotly contested topic in American politics. When did that change, is what you're thinking. <laughs> Fortunately, right, I have an answer. And the answer is in the mid to late 1970s. Okay? And it's at that point, right, in the late 70s and then through into the 80s, that's when the current political debate over the Second Amendment was ignited. And the current interpretation of the Second Amendment became, the debate around it became this idea that the Second Amendment is actually an explanation of the right of individuals to have guns. Again, either the term individual, citizen, or gun is used in the language, but that became the dominant discourse right, surrounding our, our discussion of the Second Amendment at that time. And so for the historians, right, the quest, the quest is always the same, right, is why, is causation. Why did it take on this modern rhetoric and dimensions only in the last 30 plus years? That's a question that needs an answer. How did we get here? And the answer for us is found in a careful examination of American culture. By the way, if anybody's interested in reading a, a thought-provoking book on this topic, find Scott Melzer's book, M-E-L-Z-E-R, and it's called Gun Crusaders, The Culture War. Right? And it's a fascinating study of exactly the topic we're here to talk about tonight. You can get it in our library, I believe. Well, anyway, culture war is the term that Melzer uses, and I mean, that's somewhat of a salacious term, war, but he's referencing a, a, a clash of values and attitudes that became modernly recognizable right, by the late 1970s. Okay, and that's precisely the, the, the language that leaders of organizations such as the famous NRA, the National Rifle Association, uh, they invoked that language, right, the culture war. They used that repeatedly, and that is something new for the NRA in this era of the 1970s. Now, the NRA had been around since the 1870s, 1871, actually. It was formalized in the state of New York. And for a long time, it was almost exclusively a gentleman's organization focused on hunting and marksmanship and conservation. And that was what its publications and its meetings were about. But in the 1970s, the old guard, the old leadership of the NRA, its officers either died or retired, and the new leadership changed the nature of that association. And they made it into, they, they, they deliberately formed it into the vanguard right, of what historians now call the culture war that has come to dominate, you know, the cultural clash that has come to dominate American society. They abandoned 
hunting, marksmanship, and conservation, not entirely, but they made it into an organization that was designed around advocating for the Second Amendment, in particular for, to advocate a particular interpretation of what the Second Amendment was supposed to be. Okay. And in their crusade to preserve Americans' right to bear arms, right, the culture war figured prominently in their rhetoric. For example, right, NRA president, former President Charlton Heston once warned in a speech, culture war is fought without bullets, bloodshed, or armored tanks, but liberty is lost just the same. If we lose this cultural war, he told his membership, you and your country will be less free. And in this cultural war, right, the NRA, as I say, they set it up as the vanguard in this struggle, right, to preserve the country that they saw as essential, right? And the enemies in this cultural war include, you know, in the 70s and 80s and, and today, you know, communism, right? And nanny state socialism. And you see, I'm using their, their, their terminology within their magazines and publications, nanny state socialism, right? Their terminology is in particular, right? It's, it's telling of the cultural clash itself. Not just welfare and recipients of welfare, but rather the, the, the mythological welfare mother and welfare queens and panhandlers and leeches. These are the terms that are used right, as part of this cultural conflict and debate. Feminism and, femi and feminists were held up as enemies right, in this cultural conflict. Pro-choice advocates, gay rights advocates, same-sex marriage advocates, gay people in our military. Affirmative action advocates, illegal immigrants, and sometimes any immigrants at all, right, are held up as enemies, right? Muslims, of course, and, and uh, you know, in the terminology, right, the Arab. Um, opponents of racial profiling, taxes in general, uh, the media, liberals, AKA bleeding heart liberals, uh, Democrats, you know, obviously, and, and uh, finally the most villainous of all NRA enemies in the cultural clash are gun grabbers. And the heroes in this war are almost exclusively, right, they're almost all conservative, straight, white, middle class men. And then the gender line has been broken down a little bit by the IRA in recent, or the, excuse me, by the NRA in recent years. But um, overwhelmingly, it's still a gender specific organization, right, in its attitude and, and in its membership and its funding. Okay. And as Melzer tells us, right, uh, these straight white middle class men who form the backbone of the NRA cling to a bygone identity that he refers as frontier masculinity, but actually it's much more than that. It's a new, it's, it's a very specific modern American form of identity that is not limited to the masculine, but it's, I think, Teddy Roosevelt, right? It's called uh, muscular Christian American identity. Okay. Frontier masculinity and muscular Christian American identity that's characterized by self-reliance, self-defense, and self-determination, an identity that many NRA members feel is threatened by those <laughs> aforementioned enemies and on the verge of becoming extinct. So when Charlton Heston and other famous leaders of the National Rifle Association shout from my cold, dead hands, they're not just referring to their willingness to defend to the death their right to bear arms, they're also talking about defending their masculinity and their modern, robust American uh, physical Christianity, right? And all manner of freedoms that they associate with that identity. And they'll attack any person or group that they have constructed as standing in the way even if it means denying others any semblance of freedom. Now, folks, that strategy since the 70s and 80s has been shockingly effective, and the NRA has thrived on framing rights to gun rights, excuse me, on framing threats to gun rights, which has typically involved making exaggerated claims. What do I mean by that, right? Given that there have been few gun control laws enacted during this time, and even those that were passed have been watered down, or, as in the case of the assault weapons ban, expired. It appears that the gun crusaders are winning their cultural conflict, but a diminishing threat right in the last 10 years makes it more difficult to recruit and retain members, and perhaps more importantly, to raise funds for lobbying, right, both for sustaining gun rights and for waging other various campaigns associated with the cultural conflict. Hence, the NRA constantly bombards its members with embellished claims of old and new threats to their gun ownership, highlighting various, quote unquote, slippery slopes on each new horizon and around each turn in more recent history. 
Anyway, over the past 30 years, the NRA has been perhaps the most effective group in setting what we call the dominant discourse in the so-called culture war. As a result, folks, their interpretation of the Second Amendment's meaning and purpose, though largely mythological, has also become dominant. All this is a great example of what is often in politics referred to as a sacred value, which is something that is held to be absolute. Right? If something is a sacred value, it is absolute and it resists trade-offs and you can't negotiate, you can't have a discourse of discussion about changing right, anything that is held as a sacred value. Sacred rhetoric right, is what the Second Amendment has become in modern American discourse for much of the population. It is untouchable. It has become sacred. The values and the rhetoric of the sacred has come to dominate, again, NRA publications and, and, and language. For example, uh, again, I can always run home to Chuck Heston for this, but the NRA presidential address when he was inaugurated in 2000, he concludes with the slogan for my cold he dead hand, but he uses other sacredness, a uh, sacred language elsewhere when he talks about, we know that there is sacred stuff in that wooden stock and that blued steel. Well, anyway, the Second Amendment for many Americans has become sacred rhetoric, untouchable. You can't negotiate it, right? It must be defended to the last and at all costs. And that does something important to American democracy. Sacred rhetoric is not that effective when it comes to changing minds. It's not. Okay? It does do a couple of things, though. It helps to set the course of, of uh, language that we use to debate these important issues. And it also increases political intensity. But the democratic consequences right, could be profound. One, the use of sacred rhetoric right, on this issue and others leads to more people participating because right, they feel so strongly about defense of their sacred ideas and values. So it increases citizen participation, but on the other hand, it lessens the prospects for meaningful debate. Okay, it makes it harder to have a, 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 an honest exchange of ideas with the potential of finding third ways and solutions. And at best, then, sacred rhetoric creates a contradictory influence on the health of American democracy. And I think that that's something that we need to consider when we debate these issues, right? When we, whatever side you're on, the search is for middle ground, obviously, but whatever side you're on, we must always think about why I think the way I think, each of us, right? Why do I use the terms that I use? What has cemented my ideas? Right? Where does that come from historically? I apologize for going over my time, but thank you. I'm trying to think of a good way to segue off of, of Bob's presentation. Um, he sort of finished with the, the cultural wars, and obviously my, my role here at GRCC is as an anthropologist, and so culture becomes sort of my area of expertise. Uh, I, I'm always hesitant to use sort of war and combat and sort of those metaphors, but that itself sort of segues into um, how I was going to introduce sort of my little section of time. So I was firing up ideas for this panel and was aiming to come out with my guns blazing. But in the process, I got a little gun shy. I didn't want to seem like a loose cannon or some kind of a big shot, but rather I wanted to come across like a real straight shooter by zeroing in on my target. I worried that I would go ballistic and end up shooting from the hip, so I shot down my first couple bullet points to avoid shooting myself in the foot. In retrospect, I feel like I really dodged a bullet. Now that I got my ducks in a row, I'm ready to pull the trigger on the presentation and set my, set my sights squarely on the issue at hand. What really blows me away is that all the conversation about gun violence has been so scattershot, with each side trying to take pot shots at each other. So tonight, I'm going to dig deep into my anthropological arsenal and hopefully arm each of you with a cultural perspective on the debate. Really, what it comes down to is that all of us are hoping for a magic bullet that will solve our gun violence problem. Robert Myers is a linguistic anthropologist. He describes that sort of phenomenon as gun speak. Um, and really, one of the focuses is um, what are some of the metaphors that we embed in our everyday language use as, as Americans and sort of our cultural language? And so something in terms of debates, we hear about culture wars. And so we uh, sort of frame that in, in terms of battle and argumentative and combative tones. Um, we, we literally pepper our, our language use with, with terminology and metaphors that embed guns and, and use of guns in that. I think even one of the, the news channel news releases was um, GRCC experts take aim at gun violence. Um, so playing upon those metaphors. 
Um, and as this is referred to as gun speak, and, and so what you end up seeing with these core cultural metaphors that really pervade any cultural context is that when you shift metaphors from one semantic domain, so we're talking about guns in, in one sort of, of set of areas, and we shift that over to stuff like sports or everyday interaction, um, what we're really doing is, is we're, we're creating a, a cultural context in which we tend to frame and think about issues within those particular types of light. Um, and so which gets us down to the point is I think very few of us in this room would argue against the, the idea that guns are an integral part of American culture, so to speak. Um, and yet, basically because of, of some, several recent events, that this discussion about what is the role and what is the intersections of gun within American culture, that has become thrust into the forefront front of, of really the American consciousness. And to be honest, it's an issue that I don't have anywhere near enough time. Um, I don't even think I could cover it in a semester. Of all the myriad of, of different ways that, that guns and ideas of guns and metaphors of guns are really interconnected um, into the very fabric of our culture, yet as a country, we've been attempting to sort of pull those threads out um, in, in sort of different ways. Um, so with that said, and, and try to think about sort of the overall cultural framework uh, regarding guns and center on this issue of gun violence, um, I think we really need to frame the issue um, specifically on the discussion to make it productive. Um, what can we go forward from this? Um, and so I, I, for me, the, the central question then becomes, does America have a gun problem or does America have a violence problem? I think that becomes one of the, the core questions. Um, and then for me, then, the question is, how might we think anthropologically about this? And one thing that my students probably are, are sick of hearing is, is I talk about anthropology not so much about what we do, but it's really how we study human and culture and that. So we look at interconnections between things. And so I think there is some value disciplinarily to, to think about this question of, of um, what is the role of, of different aspects of our culture and how does those manifest themselves? Um, and so to go back to the issue of do we have a gun problem? Or do we have a violence problem? So there's an old moniker that, that gets framed about. Um, and so some could ask, guns don't kill people, people do. Um, and here's my joke. Now that's a loaded question. Uh, <laughs> but fundamentally, that statement is in fact correct. Guns do not kill people. Um, it's the action or use of guns that killed people. Um, and this was one of the topics that, that Dr. Connor talked about yesterday with, with his presentation in the panel, is that video games don't kill people. Um, violent movies and that don't physically themselves kill people. It might create some uh, accentuations in, in violent behavior, but they into itself are not the root underlying causes of um, gun violence, so to speak. And so for me, America fundamentally has a violence problem, um, less so than specifically a gun problem. And so the more appropriate question then becomes, how does America's culture of guns and gun speak intersect with our violence problem? And I think when we frame the discussion in that regards, then we, we open ourselves up to a point that we can actually make meaningful progress and wade through culture wars or, um, or sort of battle and argumentative sort of metaphors and actually get at to what are, are fundamentally our root causal problems and how might we tackle them. Um, and probably the best quote I've had that really um, summarizes this very, very subtle trend of what is the intersection between America's culture of guns and gun speak and our violence problem. And David Dobbs articulates this question when he says, culture gives the impulse and form, gives the impulse form and direction. Um, so let me kind of unpack that a little bit. And it really articulates the causal direction of what's going on with this, this broader um, discussion. Culture gives the impulse form and direction. The impulse is whatever the structural causes of violence, that becomes the impulse. Individuals have violent impulses, and they act upon violent impulses. That's a cross-cultural phenomenon. That's something that we can see ethnographically in every single culture out there. What is unique about the American context is that our culture has embedded gun speak and guns, and everybody probably has, even within the course of today, used some sort of gun metaphor within their everyday language. And so when there are underlying impulses that lead to violence, our peculiar culture of guns and gun speaks give that impulse its form and its direction. And so when we, we sort of think about in that regard, America fundamentally has a violence problem. Um, unfortunately, within this cultural context, um, guns really make that violence problem much more lethal. Um, and that is essentially is, is where we need to, to focus our attention to it. And so if guns don't kill people, they certainly make violent actions more lethal. Um, and if that's the problem, then what might be a, an appropriate solutions for dealing with that problems? 
Um, and I think one thing that is, is often um, clear with some of the data we have, particularly after sort of the effects of the most recent assault weapons ban that expired, is that banning guns or banning certain guns fundamentally does not change those underlying problems. Because as I just pointed out, guns are not the underlying problem. The violence are, and, and the guns and the metaphor of guns gives form and direction to those impulses. But the gun and removing guns for themselves does not fundamentally change America's violence problem. Um, the other major dimension or thread that um, I think when we think anthropological about this that we have to make a distinction of is the difference between individual and structural issues. Um, and so individual issues um, and structural solutions and, and structural issues really operate at different scales. Um, and that's really, I think, when I listen to all the rhetoric around um, the gun debate within America that's portrayed um, in multiple dimensions, that one of the critical dimensions is we have individuals that come from this from a structural perspective, and we have individuals coming from an individualistic perspective. Uh, for instance, an individualistic solution to this problem of violence is to bear arms and defend oneself from potential violence. Um, and when you talk to most gun owners, that's the perspective of why they own guns, is there's a degree of, of safety that that gun affords. Uh, there's nothing wrong with that perspective to think otherwise would be ethnocentric when you're looking at what specifically would be an individual's reason for wanting to bear arms and defend themselves, regardless of, of the historical context surrounding how the Second Amendment might have been shifted in its historical interpretation. Our reality is today we live in a violent society, and guns is an individualistic solution for dealing with that. Um, and I have, like, a, I have a wife that I love dearly. Um, and for me, the issue of do I purchase a gun or do I have a gun to defend my family in that becomes a very individualistic response to that. Um, and so that's one side of the issue and one side of the debate. Um, however, uh, we, anybody who would agree or even disagree with the individualistic solution or individualist approach should also acknowledge that there are underlying structural causes to violence in American society. Um, and if the guns are not this, the structural cause, but violence is, what can we do to articulate what those specific structural problems are? And so what do we do about this? Um, for me, in sort of an anthropological perspective, is two central questions. How do we as a society identify what those underlying structural causes of violence are that our culture of guns makes more lethal by providing the form and direction? And two, how do we as a society better mitigate those structural causes of violence? So irrespective of doing anything with the availability or supply of guns, if we can reduce the underlying root causes of structural violences that manifest themselves in American society, then we've taken a couple steps towards the right direction of um, what everybody's ultimate goal is on all sides of debate, which is to save lives. So what types of structural violences do we have? Um, and you can probably outline um, any number of, of different uh, sort of perspectives in terms of how gun violence uh, turns lethal. We have accidental discharges. That's a really not a, a, some, some degree of a structural problem. But um, to what extent are people getting and, and, and having accurate training towards uh, possessing weapons and, and keeping them safe? But accidents are, are one leading cause of, of um, gun violence and death, domestic and interpersonal violence. Um, are people having sort of interpersonal skills? Is there something in there that is creating behavior that becomes much more violent? Um, and one of the sort of uh, perspectives I think is touched upon a little bit and has come out is, is a recognition that um, a lot of, of interpersonal violence is, is being done um, essentially by young male individuals. And so there's often rhetoric called hypermasculinity um, that separates around this, is that individuals um, have somehow coded their masculine behavior with aggressiveness. Um, and that, that creates that impulse that leads to violent behavior. That's the structural cause. When you add the culture of guns into it, what that does is give that underlying violent impulse form and direction. And it's that peculiar form of direction that we have is what ultimately leads to a, an increase in the lethalness um, of that. Uh, mental health is, is becoming a, a big uh, issue regarding some of the mass um, mass trauma events that have recently occurred in terms of the Aurora shooting and Newton as well. And so um, we, we can look at mental health from a number of different perspectives. Uh, we can look at it from different psychoses that are manifested themselves in, in high body count incidences. Or uh, probably the more uh, prevalent cause of mental health that, that ultimately leads to gun violence is depression and ultimately suicide. Um, and that's, that's probably one of the most common effects um, of which guns in a household 
provide form and direction to an impulse. Anybody who is suffering from de depression is going to have, at some point, a suicidal impulse. The gun and the culture surrounding the availability of guns and the mentality of guns and the use of guns provides form and direction to that impulse. Um, and then violent crimes is, is probably one of the more publicized dimension. It might not be the most um, numerically um, uh, volume-wise side of this debate, but it becomes um, one of the more public uh, sides of it because um, obviously we, we push that out in, in our, our news media and that. So armed assaults and robberies um, and a, a huge body of, of research surrounding gang violence and that. Um, but underlying those is, is what ultimately causes those, those pipes of, of um, attributes in a society and that structurally leads to people um, behaving violently. Um, and then if they create the impulse of violent behavior, then what you have is, is an incident where uh, the gun provides the form and direction to that particular violence. Um, one of the best anthropological studies of, of that issue is, is Philippe Bourgeois, um, who's done a lot of work um, doing ethnography in inner city areas. And, and when um, he works in communities that um, are involved in illicit gun trade and involved in heavy gang activity, um, one of the things that, that seems to show up in terms of the underlying causes, it's not drugs per se. It's really a lack of economic opportunity for individuals in certain communities. Um, so individuals that are stuck um, in, a, in an area where they're, they're not afforded um, a lot of, of valuable economic opportunity, they might be able to enter into the workforce in very, very low level um, tasks that, that create a lot of, of um, sort of demeaning interaction. They're, they encounter a lot of oppression, a lot of, of um, racist sentiment, ethnocentric sentiment, um, and that really pushes people in and out of the formal workforce. And when they get pushed out of the formal workforce, oftentimes what an adaptation to that in an impoverished context is to seek um, informal means of income. And obviously probably the most profitable form of informal income becomes um, being involved in illicit drug trade. Um, but underlying all that ends up sort of, of when, when Bourgeois did the, the ethnography and talks to individuals that are involved in that cultural context, underlying that, that, that gives them the impulse in the first place, is really this thirst for American uh, opportunity. They want to be recognized. They want to have the respect of their peers. They go into activities that have high prestige within those local cultural contexts. Unfortunately, the manifestation in that particular cultural struggle for respect then becomes the need to act in hyper-masculine behaviors and act out aggressively. Uh, and then when you put that in the peculiar um, gun speak and, and culture of guns that we have established here in, in the United States, that provides a, an unusually lethal form and direction. Um, so, I mean, you can take it all the way down to some issues such as, as fundamentally respect in some of those regards. Um, so I ask anybody in here, think back to your young years as a, a young individual, um, how many dumb things have you done out of the search of misguided notion for respect? Um, and that really is no different in any other context. And so that becomes one manifestation <laughs> of it. That's the impulse. Um, but, and so what we need to do rather than focus on um, the proximate cause, which is the lethality provided by guns, is to focus more on um, what can we do to, to sort of deal with and mitigate some of these structural influences in society. Um, I wish I had a great answer. Um, I might have a great answer, but I don't have any time, right? Uh, <laughs> but I, I, for me, the one uh, major anthropological lesson is, is regarding top-down and bottom-up approaches to dealing with stuff. And we see this occurring in development contexts where we attempt a lot of top-down approaches to impose things, and we get a lot of impersonable uh, resistance in local contexts. And I think we're going to experience that if we attempt really severe top-down approaches to dealing with issues, particularly in American society, because guns, gun speak, and this, this culture of guns is so deeply interwoven into the very fabric of who we think we are as Americans. Um, and so I think the bottom-up approach is, definitely becomes a much more effective way because that helps you get across a lot of barriers of, of impersonal resistance. Um, and so um, that's my hope, is that's where the direction the discussion will come to. Rather than focusing on some of the semantics, focusing on some of the, the culture war, so to speak, let's move beyond that and recognize that. Um, there's individual responses to, to protecting oneself from violence, but regardless of your individual response at this moment in time, which is proximate, that the ultimate problem we have are structural violences. And what we need to do is have a conversation as a country to figure out what we can do to mitigate those structural problems and prevent our impulses or the impulses of individuals from taking an unusually lethal form and direction. Uh, good evening. Right. In 1996, uh, lone gunmen in the country of Australia 
uh, killed 35 people by using semi-automatic guns and a shotgun. Uh, the same year, under the leadership of a fairly conservative Prime Minister, John Howard, uh, the, Australia, uh, the country of Australia created uh, what I would call a social contract. Uh, that social contract was an agreement among the uh, state governments, uh, federal government, and local governments to pass a new gun restriction laws. Uh, these laws was very restrictive, and it still is. Uh, first of all, this particular law passed by the Australian Parliament uh, banned all kinds of semi-automatic weapons, including the shotguns, from the civilian ownership. Uh, uh, the law also uh, required a mandatory gun buyback program. Uh, so what basically a partnership of local, state, and federal government in Australia wanted to do is to force people to basically sell them their guns. Uh, in the four years of the implementation of the buyback, the country of Australia bought back around 650,000 semi-automatic weapons. Uh, uh, this particular law also basically bans uh, the use of guns for things like self-defense. Uh, when one wants to buy a gun in the country of Australia, one has to state the reason why they need that gun. Then they have to wait for a month and then go through the background check for six months. Uh, none of the acceptable reasons include self-defense. Uh, one of the acceptable reasons is sportsmanship. Another is hunting. But once again, none of them include self-defense. Uh, each gun is registered, each bought gun from a dealer or private person is registered with the police, like any other car, uh, which basically uh, reduced the number of gun households in Australia to 20%, from 60 to 20%. Before the gun law was introduced, the gun ownership of the households that owned guns were around 60%. Now it's around 20%. Uh, so how did the law do? Did the law prevent any violence? I think we can talk about two separate things. Uh, one thing is the question, did the law prevent mass shootings? Uh, before the law was introduced, there were 15 mass shootings in the country of Australia. Mass shooting, according to Australian law, is defined as four or more people killed. After the law was introduced, there was zero. Since 1996, Australia hasn't had an instance of mass shootings. So there was no instance in the country of Australia, but in one shooting, four or more people were killed. Uh, there is some mixed evidence about the rate of homicides. And some studies are talking about 40% drop in the rate of homicides. But that particular evidence is not statistically strong enough because the rate of homicides in the country of Australia was falling anyway before the law was introduced. So the main question was, did the law precipitate it or sped up the fall in the homicide rate? Uh, the answer is perhaps but there is no conclusive, statistically significant evidence to prove that. However, it is also clear that the number of home invasions didn't go up after all these guns were banned. Uh, you probably know that one of the main reasons why people would like to own semi-automatic guns in the United States is to defend themselves from home invasions. So the hypothesis of researchers was well, if semi-automatic guns were banned in the country of Australia, then the number of home invasions would go up because people would not have, have weapons to defend themselves. That did not happen. Uh, another interesting finding is that the number of armed robberies dropped for over, by over 40% since the gun laws were introduced. 
the number of the, the biggest surprise was the number of suicides. The number of suicides by guns dropped by 69 percent, which is somehow an incredible number. What is interesting, the number of homicides by other means, which means means other than guns, didn't go up. Uh, so the number of, Swiss, of uh, homicides by other means remained constant or dropping very slowly. Um, so uh, is it true that this very restrictive uh, gun law worked in the sense of preventing uh, mass murders? Well, uh, nothing is certain in social sciences because Social sciences deal with human behavior. It is very difficult to isolate particular variable that influence this human behavior. And, but I would say there is around 80% of likelihood that this particular thing worked in the terms of preventing new mass murders. Did it work in terms of uh, lowering uh, the number of homicides just because of that law? The evidence is not entirely clear. And, However, did it negatively influence the picture of violence in uh, the country of Australia? Uh, the answer is no. There was no increase in homicides by alternative means, and there was no increase in, uh, in the numbers of uh, home invasion per year. And, oh, just a moment. That was part of the music that I <laughs> prepared for my presentation. <laughs> Right. So, uh, could we do something like that in the United States? Or if we do it, uh, could it work? And my answer is no. <laughs> On the first count. My answer is no, we cannot do it here in the United States. Why? Uh, the first answer is this pesky Second Amendment. And the Second Amendment said, well-regulated militia being necessary for the defense of a free state, the right of people to bear arms shall not be infringed. Uh, uh, if one reads the amendment literally, as I do, I would say, because well-regulated militia is necessary, therefore, people have the right to bear arms. Uh, is well-regulated militia still necessary to defend a state? Who is going to attack a state? Uh, my students say, Canada. <laughs> I disagree. But I think another key word in this particular amendment is regulated. Uh, there were two major cases before the Supreme Court. Well, I should say two only cases before the Supreme Court that uh, in which Supreme Court dealt with the issue of the Second Amendment. And uh, both of these cases were very late. In 2008, only in 2008, the Supreme Court dealt with the issue of Second Amendment for the first time. Right? One of the questions before uh, the Supreme Court was, does the right of the people to bear arms depend on their belonging to a well-regulated militia, as Second Amendment says? Right. The Supreme Court rejected the notion of militia, but the Supreme Court didn't reject the notion of regulated. So uh, Supreme Court in the famous case, Heller versus District of Columbia in 2008, argued while you do not have to belong to a militia in order to have the right to carry arms, the government local government, state government, federal government, they all have the power to regulate what arms you can carry, where you can carry these arms, right? and under what circumstances. Right? So Supreme Court disagreed with Heller, who was the plaintiff in the case, and the gun dealer, by the way, right? who claimed that uh, the people's right to bear arms in the United States is not limited or restricted. Supreme Court said, yes, look at the Constitution, look at the Second Amendment. There is a word regulated there. So if the word regulated is there, 
according to the Supreme Court, that means that that particular right can be limited. Uh, the second reason why uh, this particular uh, buyback program would not work in the United States is that alternative weapons would be easily available. Right? So if uh, the government takes away your weapons but doesn't ban the sale of it, which is protected by in the interpretation of the Supreme Court by the Second Amendment, you can easily get a new one. Right? So alternative weapons are basically easily available. Right? The third reason is what uh, my colleagues already mentioned is a, is a different gun culture. And, uh, this country has been built on the notion of um, severe individualism. And, and this individualism, usually in um, American politics, has been juxtaposed to government. Right? So in American uh, political mythology, there is always a tension between the rights of individuals and the power of the government. Right? So if you really take a careful look at the First Amendment, first 10 amendments of the Constitution, right? these 10 amendments of the Constitution are in fact all about the right to privacy, right? all about individual protections against unnecessary encroachment of the government in the private life of individuals. Right? And finally, I think perhaps, I would say last but not least, why it is that uh, this, this kind of law could never even be passed in the United States by Congress is the American electoral system. In the United States, the electoral system is what in political science we call the single district plurality system. <laughs> that means that uh, each electoral district, there are 435 electoral districts in the United States, which gives us 435 representatives in the House of Representatives, right? So each district gives one representative to Congress. But in order for a person, for a candidate to win in each district, this particular candidate does not have to have the majority of votes. This particular candidate can have only most votes but not majority. Majority would mean 50% plus one vote, right? So if there are more than two candidates, conceivably, you can go to Congress by 40% of the votes cast. Why is that important? This is important because, as French political scientist Diverget noted, this kind of elections, winner-take-all elections, or single district plurality elections, generate only two major political parties in representative body. So this is why we have only two major political parties in American Congress, because of the structure of the American electoral system, winner take all. If you just have two major political parties competing and only one of them can go to Congress, why would anybody vote for anybody else? If you remember Ralph Nader, right, who perennially ran for office all the time, <laughs> He didn't have a chance because even people who liked him, liked him didn't want to vote for him because they thought they would lose their vote. I mean, they would just waste their vote right? without, sending somebody, without sending somebody to Congress. Right? But imagine if the United States had a proportional parliamentary system in which each political party that crosses the threshold of 5% of the vote would be represented in parliament like it is where I come from, in Europe. No? That would basically provoke political candidates to try to reach middle ground with other political parties, because nobody would have 50% plus more seats in the Congress. So the playing of extremist politics would not be possible, because in order for the people to, in order for the candidates to get to Congress, they would have to compromise with others. No? So uh, if the compromise was necessary in order for political candidates to go to Congress, that would basically open the politicians to less extreme and more moderate positions. And that would perhaps open 
uh, political space and open up political incentive for some kind of an agreement for basically gun laws to be instituted. Why, are, why am I only talking about gun laws? Why do I think that despite the fact that uh, guns may not kill people, people kill people, but at the same time, if people do not have guns, then they can inflict less damage. Right? And it's easier for the politicians to regulate guns than to regulate mental health. Just a few days before the Sandy Hook shootings, we had an attack by a student in China. The student came to school, but he didn't have access to guns, so he brought a knife. He stabbed a bunch of students, but he didn't kill anybody. Imagine if he had access to guns. I'll yield to my colleague, please. All right. I can tell us what you're all waiting for, the economic perspective on this. I, um, I really appreciate the opportunity to be here with my colleagues in social science because economics is a means of analysis and it's done more fully. Um, we can do better analysis if we understand these different perspectives. So I need to understand the historian's perspective, the historical con um, context here, as well as the cultural context and thinking about some of the, um, some of the institutional issues from a political science perspective too. So here's the way an economist thinks. Right? We study the way people make choices. Right? So we're studying individual choices um, and how those choices interact and the consequences of those choices for society. So um, when I think about guns, this is sort of an interesting choice that someone can make. Right? Because you get to choose whether or not to buy a gun. Right? Um, but I am affected by that choice. Um, we call um, these side effects externalities. Everybody say this word with me, externalities. externalities. You'll sound very smart if you use that word often. It just means a side effect. Um, and so the big question in economics, well, the big question in this market is are these side effects positive or negative when it comes to guns? Because if you listen to the rhetoric of the NRA, um, as Professor Hendershot was saying, um, it sounds like it's positive that guns can protect you and that people having guns in our classrooms at GRCC would make us all safer because then if a bad guy comes in, somebody else will be able to take him out. Right? Um, on the other hand, you have other people saying, well, you know, at a community college in Texas a few weeks ago, um, someone was caught in the middle of a gunfight um, and so a bystander was hurt. So this is the real question, right? This is the fundamental question is, are these side effects positive or negative? So if my neighbor buys a gun, does that make me safer? Because people will know that my neighborhood is not a place where you want to mess around? Um, or does that make me less safe, either because my neighbor might misuse the gun or because there's a potential for theft of that gun and then they come to my house next with now having a gun um, and the ability to use it? Um, so that's the fundamental question. Economists have spent um, quite a bit of time and effort trying to figure this out, um, trying to measure these things. Um, and one of the most well-known papers is by Cook and Ludwig. It was, pu um, it was published in 2006. Um, so they did a study to try to figure out what are the external costs um, or benefits of gun ownership. Um, and what they found was that the external costs, so the cost to other people of a household becoming a gun-owning household um, is somewhere between, and this is a wide range, it's between $100 and $1,800, right? So a very wide range, um, but it's negative, right? Which means, for example, that if my colleague who has an office right next to mine um, decides to buy a gun, um, that has a cost to me. Now, that leaves us room to think that there might be a way that we can make things better. Right? It doesn't mean um, that someone shouldn't be allowed to own a gun. Clearly, we have this right in our country. Um, but it does tell us that when they make that choice, it won't necessarily be the optimal one. Because when people make a decision of whether to buy something, they're thinking about their own benefits and costs, and probably not the cost imposed on other people. Some of us might think through how our neighbors are affected by things, um, but, um, but maybe not fully. 
So then we ask, what do we do about this? So how can we make this better? Uh, and I, um, I could talk about all different policies um, all night, but let me just give you an example of the way that economists might think about how do we fix a problem like this. Um, so for example, you all, um, if you drove here tonight, um, then you likely have insurance on your car. Right? Otherwise, you're driving illegally. Right. So we require someone, in order to have their car registered, um, to have car insurance. Right. Um, and the primary reason for that is not, um, not to protect you if you get an accident so you can fix your car. It's actually for other people. Right. There's liability here. Right. So there is a potential when you are driving a vehicle that you could hurt someone else, right. likely inadvertently, but you could hurt someone else. Right. And so the question is, um, what's going to happen in that case? Right? So we require you to get car insurance um, in order to account for that. So some economists would say, why in the world do we not require some sort of liability insurance for someone that owns a gun? Right. Um, because other people could potentially be affected by you owning a gun. Right. It doesn't mean that you're irresponsible. It doesn't mean that you're going to misuse it. Um, but there's another gun out there, and it has the potential to harm someone else. Right. Um, so our insurance industry um, knows very well how to assess risk. Right. So in the case of gun ownership, um, in order to get a registration for a gun, uh, perhaps they're going to ask you some questions, right. like your age or your gender, the same questions they ask you when you get your car insurance. Right. Um, maybe something, instead of what type of car are you driving, maybe what type of gun are you buying. Some guns might be a little bit more risky than others. Right. Some 70-year-old rifle that you inherited from your grandfather, probably not really risky. Um, but other, you know, some of these semi-automatic weapons might, um, might be quite different. Um, they might ask you, where are you going to store this weapon? Right? Just like when I got my car insurance, they asked me, um, how far was it for me to drive to work? They wanted to know how many miles I was going to be driving. So if we ask those kind of questions, um, then the insurance um, industry should be able to adequately, um, hopefully well, um, assess our risk. Right, the risk of us owning a gun um, on other people. Right? So for example, if you live out in the country and you've got a safe for your gun and it's going to be locked up all the time except for during hunting season when you use it, um, the insurance rate for you would likely be very low. Right? Whereas if you lived in um, downtown Chicago and you were an 18-year-old that dropped out of high school, you might not be able to afford to get insurance for a gun because the risk would be so high. Right? Um, and so making that kind of adjustment right, encourages people to take into account those external costs. Right? By paying that insurance rate, they're acknowledging the cost to society of their, call, of their decision to get a gun. Now, it's not perfect, right? um, but, um, but it might change behaviors a little bit. Right? Uh, for example, if... Um, if you know that your insurance rate is going to be lower for your gun if you have it locked up, then maybe you're going to do a better job of doing that. Right? Um, or maybe if you are assessed at having a very, very high risk of having a gun, um, you might decide not to get one. Right? Um, and maybe that risk assessment is because of the number of guns that have been stolen in your neighborhood in the last five years. And that might be better for society to not have more guns available to be stolen. Um, so that kind of adjustment would make sense from an economic perspective. There are other policies that we can look at. Um, so for example, the loophole where if you're at these um, gun shows where there's no background check required. Right. Now, from an, um, from an economic perspective, we want to think about choices and the costs and benefits of those choices um, and the costs and benefits of policies in the same way. Right. Um, so getting rid of that loophole. Right? and forcing everyone that buys a gun, even at a gun show, um, to, get, um, to have a background check done. Well, for law-abiding citizens, that's not a huge inconvenience. Right? Maybe a small inconvenience. Right? Um, and it may have a huge benefit. Right? And that we don't have people that are in gangs in Chicago driving outside the city, going to a gun show, and picking up 30 guns on the weekend. Um, so thinking about those types of policies, where can we get the most amount of public safety uh, at the least cost in terms of um, not just 
um, infringing on freedoms, but also inconvenience for law-abiding citizens that have um, appropriate uses for guns. Um, so that's um, generally the way that economists look at these things. Right? We want to think about how can we make it better. There is nothing, nothing that suggests that this market would work right, right? would work well and in a socially optimal way if we just leave it alone. Right? There are clear external costs here. Right? So then the big question is what can we do about them? Right? And how can we think about this? Um, you know, maybe one policy at a time. All right, shall we open it for questions? I think we should. Let's give them a round of applause first. If you have questions, just raise your hand. I'll be happy to bring the microphone around as quickly as I can move. Well, I have a couple of questions. I can't recall your name. Uh, Mr. I Carr? Do, Mr. Carr, I do apologize. But I was listening to what you were saying, and I want well, the cultural standpoint of view. And I was thinking, could it be a cultural thing that the nation has a right, or the notion of, of the right to do whatever they please? And our culture being a part of a problem, meaning that going back over 300 years ago, a culture that would, would have the uh, take whatever they want, when they want, without any conscience or regret. Now, if you go back many, many hundreds of years ago, that's the way our country was. So this is a cultural thing that's been going on and on in years. And what I'm referring to is the mass murders. Now, as I mentioned to you, Mr. Hendershot, Dr. Hendershot, earlier about the elephant in the room we were discussing earlier, which you didn't, I didn't hear you say anything about, but I will address it. These mass murders in Aurora, uh, Newtown, were profiled of single white males from 17 to 25. That's the issue right there. And what we want to find out is not pointing blame, is why is that happening? Now, mental health, according to the doctor last night, that there's no mental health issues with these people committing these crimes because they know exactly what they're doing. They've had time to plan these out, months and months to plan this information out. So this notion of mental issues, I beg to differ on that. I guess I would like to see some stats on that. As far as your comment, for as far as Australia, it's working over there. You're saying there's no statistics, but you had mentioned that it dropped from 60 to 40 percent, or from 40 percent now to 20. Where did those stats come from? If there's no statistics no, on I it. said that there is uh, no uh, evidence of statistical significance in some aspects. Right? Statistical significance means does it make? I mean, every statistical model has an error, right? So is the movement larger than an error? And some studies are saying there is no movement that is larger than an error, statistical error. Right? But that's in, only in some aspects. Uh, the, the improvement in the number of uh, suicides is clearly, uh, is clear, right? The very fact that uh, before uh, the law was instituted, Australia had 15 incidents of mass shootings, and since 1996, there was no incident in which four or more people were killed. That's significant all in itself, right? So uh, I didn't make such a blanket <laughs> statement, right? I'm, so, I'm sorry? That's right, yes, yes. Mm -hmm. But the question is about how to uh, sort sorry. of uh, decouple that improvement from potential trends that were already in existence prior to the laws, and so it becomes a, basically a statistical question in that regard. Um, I'm just trying to think of a way to unpack your question since it kind of interwove its way through everybody's uh, presentation with that. And so, and we, we appreciate that. So, uh, uh, so I guess in terms of, well, you raised a point in regards to individualism, and, and uh, Professor Verzik talked about sort of the tension between the individual and the state that sort of is, is deeply embedded in American society, and then you sort of shifted over to talking about sort of the ethnicity um, ethnic background of individuals that are um, interacting with um, sort of violence in, in p particular ways. And so you referenced the two most recent mass murders. The two most recent ones, um, you, you were referencing essentially a middle aged or young uh, white males. Um, but then we can go back and talk about um, sort of the ethnicity regarding Virginia Tech. Um, and then uh, basically what I was referencing in terms of some of the structural violences that emerge in inner city areas is generally plaguing 
uh, individuals of African American and, and, and Hispanic ethnicities. And so basically, what we're seeing is, is some of the same violent responses, but what they're doing is they're manifesting themselves in culturally different ways because of the specific cultural context in where they are. So you're, you're right in terms of, of looking at a profile of a mass murderer, but part of that profile has more to do with, with their particular cultural and life, lived experiences that are different than somebody else's cultural and lived experiences. But both of those are, are reacting violently um, to probably a different suite of underlying causes that push them in that direction. So that's definitely something to, to think about in terms of how do we go forward to, to dealing with these issues is uh, one, a one-size-fit-all solution is not going to cover all those different lived contexts. And so um, I think that, um, like I was saying, is a more bottom-up approach is going to give you the flexibility to realize that in this context, this is what we need to be paying attention to. In this context, this is what's going to be um, a more effective uh, return on that. Um, I'd be hesitant to project the, the, some of those ideas that far back into history, though, and make a generalizing statement. But my colleague might. <laughs> this is difficult. And of course, I mean, in terms of who these mass murderers are as individuals and what is, I mean, this was Dr. Connor's presentation yesterday, which I believe will be available on our college YouTube channel for those of you who were not able to attend. For those of you who weren't able to attend. But uh, yeah, as far as the psychology of someone who would commit a mass murder, I mean, will vary dramatically on a case-by-case -case basis. According to the data that we have, looking at the past 20 years, I mean, if we had all of these mass murderers, you know, in a row, they are a remarkably homogeneous group and that they're, you know, white men in their 20s. Not exclusively, of course, but that is the pattern. And, you know, if we are going to take a view towards doing that, I mean, the other pattern that fits, right, with, you know, this particular, you know, group is that most of these crimes were perpetuated with legally bought firearms. And so it is logical to deduce that there's a problem with legal firearms falling into the hands of a population that, you know, is, has a pre tendency, right, a predilection to use them, right, in a uh, mass murder type situation. Not all of them, of course, right, but we can at least target our work, right, where the problem lies. No? Well, I mean, I think a, well, yeah, it certainly, there's a lot of, um, a lot of money involved, but I think an overemphasis on these mass killings is not an effective way to go about this. We have over 80 gun deaths every single day in this country. So if we're just going to focus on, um, you know, the mass killings over the last 10 years, we wouldn't get to how many deaths there have been in just in this month right, in the country. So I think we want to think more broadly. And the mass killings are a particularly perplexing issue because they do seem quite random. They don't happen often. Um, but I, there are clear things that we could do to cut down on this over 80 deaths a day. Um, so I'd like to see us focus on that, right? So. I guess I go off the statistic here that, well, the 69% drop in suicide, and of course I was, was here last night, um, was a lot of the mass shootings are suicide with hostile intent, mm -hmm. which is actually a major thought on the um, psychological view of them. Do you think it would be a secondary um, effect if the, with a 69% drop in suicides by gun and almost all these um, mass shootings being hostile intent with weapons, do you think that would actually decrease the chances for mass, uh, mass shootings? If there's a question for anybody if they want to answer it. I was talking about Australia, so. Yeah. <laughs> this does, it does hit on what Dr. Connor was talking about last night in terms of, uh, he mentioned most the profile of most of these mass shooters is that they, their intent is to die in the act of these mass shootings. So I think the question is, if the, if the statistics in Australia are true and it's 69% drop in suicides, then perhaps you would also reduce the amount of mass killings. It's a good question. Maybe not one that 
they can answer, but that's one maybe we could send to Dr. I, Connor. I, <laughs> mass killings. I, yeah, well, there, uh, I mean, you are somehow assuming that uh, there is a mass, ma that people commit mass shootings in order to commit suicides. That's exactly that's, what he was told last night. Uh, <laughs> I, uh, frankly, I haven't thought about that idea that people do that in order to, uh, that people perform mass shootings in order to commit suicide. So um, uh, it seems to me like uh, they kill themselves uh, in order not to get caught, but not that they start killing because they want to commit suicide. But I may be wrong. So uh, uh, it seems, it looks to me like a reverse causation. But uh, as I said, I may be wrong. So I wouldn't be able to answer your question with any certainty. The part I love about that is he was here last night, and I think it's an awesome question. It's a good oh. idea. We'll have to ask Dr. Connor. Um, I also have a question about the 69% reduction in suicide rates. I know you spoke to homicide and said that that remained constant. Do you have any information just about the number of suicides by other, by other means? Uh, the number of uh, suicide by other means remain, remains constant, yes, uh, according to the research from, uh, uh, I mean, the most recent research was published in 2010 uh, by two professors from Australian National University, which is a premier uh, university in, 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 the, in the country of Australia. So uh, uh, just because uh, suicide by guns went down, did not necessarily cause uh, suicide by other means to go up. No. Anyone else? Yeah. Okay. Um, off the uh, hyper masculinity comment that you made um, earlier, I kind of feel as if our country does that in a sense. Um, basically showing off our big guns to other countries around the world. So why is it as a country we're trying to fix the problem within ourselves but can still do it outside of our country? Did your father tell you to ask that question? <laughs> <laughs> it's a wonderful question. It's a great question. Um, really, it, it, I'm, I'm hesitant to really sort of project that too far to sort of include sort of the national consciousness, but um, you do think, you see the, the similar types of, of metaphorical references in terms of, of masculinity. And um, I think within American culture that, um, I'm not gonna say it in here, but I think a lot of us could probably come up with a, a fairly sizable list of euphemisms that um, equate guns and sort of masculine elements together. And so there's definitely a, a very close sort of parallel with that. So not necessarily within sort of, of people um, overly sort of, of accentuating that, that, that masculinity element, but um, the two issues go hand in hand in terms of thinking about um, the metaphors that we use to describe our person and, and um, how we envision ourselves in the, the larger sort of context. So in that regard, um, you're probably correct in, in that. Um, you, you, not to, to, to throw the media or anything like that under the bus, but um, I think um, we have a realization that a lot of these gendered identities are, are something that are um, culturally prescribed in us by various uh, sort of media and images that, that we portray or, or sort of are, are conditioned towards in addition to the languages that, that we use around ourselves. And that I think that that leads to um, a desire for individuals that embrace that identity to want to um, firmly mark that, whether that, that takes a violent form, whether that's compensation in there, or if it's a search for um, some sort of masculine identity through some other act. Um, again, that impulse might be there, and it's just how that form and direction that, that comes out. And so in some contexts, it takes a very violent form. Other contexts, it takes a form where people are striving after excelling in a sports context because they get the prestige and respect in that regard. Um, and so I, I think you're correct in that regard, that we can sort of uh, extend that, that metaphor to include a, a number of different aspects of American culture. And that was probably a very long-winded answer to a, a good question. So. Uh, th there is a very uh, long and strong tradition in political science of, re of feminist research that uh, basically is trying to analyze um, the use of language and metaphor in the context of international politics and projection of... Uh, 
American military power to other countries, right? For example, one of the uh, most uh, frequently used uh, words for special force invasion is penetration. And, uh, I don't know if you have noticed that uh, all missiles have a shape of erect penis. And so there is a, there is a, there is a such interpretation among the feminist uh, uh, international relations scholars who are basically claiming that the shapes and words that are used in the study of international politics and the military are basically are coming from the feeling of masculine superiority. And if international politics was uh, dominated and governed by women, some feminist scholars are arguing, uh, the understanding of American power or of power in general would be different. Uh, while masculine uh, definition of power is uh, trying, uh, actor E, A, trying to basically force actor B to do what actor B otherwise would not do. Uh, and Tickner, uh, she's a professor from University of, from UCLA, she's claiming that uh, the use of uh, female power would be the one in which your potential opponent is given respect and thus, uh, by giving respect to a potential opponent, it would basically easier be, it would be easier for the United States or other countries to persuade that opponent to do what otherwise would not do, rather than twisting their arm uh, by the threat of power of weapons. Right? So gender speak and uh, uh, understanding of uh, how countries behave in politics and how to project their power, uh, for many analysts, is uh, basically uh, conditioned or is caused by who is dominant in that power. And uh, dominant people who basically govern international power of the United States are men. And therefore, these analysts are saying uh, the understanding of how the United States behave towards other countries is uh, male. Is there a question back here? And uh, just to come in a little bit on that point, there are exceptions to that as well. And just listening to my, my colleague speak, I'm thinking about Secretary Hillary Clinton and Secretary Madeleine Albright, right, who uh, were, you know, powerful women in the United States government who did not hesitate in the case of Madeleine Albright throughout the 90s, right, to bomb the bejesus out of Iraq whenever they detected a large bird in the no-fly zone. Uh, and and uh, you know, there was no hesitation to use force, and I don't know that in every case gender would, would determine American foreign policy. And back to our, 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 our colleague in the back, your, your initial question about does the belligerency of American foreign policy you know, have something to do with the, with the violence within our, our domestic borders? And, and uh, I add a strong yes to that. I mean, a violent society will manifest in a multitude of ways, both externally and internally. And I think that we'll see that in other countries around this world as well, right? Nations with a violent foreign policy will have violent problems inside of their country. Um, nations with a more peaceful foreign policy will have, you know, I should think, you know, considerably less violence within their country. Um, I think violence, both international and domestic, is always correlated. Thank you. Did you have a question? Thank you very much for this opportunity. It's, you cannot have an intelligent conversation online about this stuff, and I very much appreciate your analysis. I, I hope you take this on the road. Um, and, and I have so many topics I'd like to cover, but I won't. I'll just kind of have a small list here. Uh, start with the media, culpability. A very short example. When I was a kid in parochial, parochial school, they took the whole you know, K through 8 to see the cross and the switchblade, was, which was about gang members you know, finding God. We didn't take that message back to the playground. We went out and played gang fights. You know, that's what we did. Kids emulate what they see. Our 16-year-olds spend all night watching Team Fortress 2, or playing Team Fortress 2. They spend all night gleefully killing each other. And it's a riot. It's very entertaining. But what are they learning, and what are they taking into their brains? Okay? Same thing with Hollywood. While, this, while they are, you know, these, these uh, celebrities are coming out and demonizing anybody that would want a gun, they're on the screen shooting each other. Yet they have no culpability because maybe they've bought you know, immunity through their influence. Human nature. One thing I enjoy about reading 
you know, the thoughts of our founding fathers, is that they experienced tyranny, they fought it directly, and they tried to give us some tools to protect ourselves from it because they didn't take human nature out of the equation. We are not separate from nature. When things get rough, we become predators, okay? We have a survival instinct. We've sur we evolved to survive, to kill things, to fight, to eat, okay? And to fight each other. Our brains are set up to be us and them type of critters. So how do you take that out, okay? How can you tell me or any other man who fears for his family because the neighborhood isn't so nice anymore that you can't defend yourself, that you have no right to do that? Okay, that that is irresponsible and you are a defective person for wanting to do it. These are places where I have some serious conflict with the red arc that's out there. I wish I... Yes. I love all your passion, right? But four or five questions at once to four panelists is going to get crazy. So if it's okay, we can address some of that. If you'd like, anybody would like to take that? Lisa, maybe first, and we'll go down the row if you guys want to address any of that. Um, well, let me take your last point. I, I honestly don't think that anyone is suggesting that you shouldn't have a right to have a gun in your home. And I think um, there's so much misinformation out there. And Professor Hendershot talked about this early on. This, um, the rhetoric out there is just not true. Um, and so uh, when I'm looking at this from an economic perspective, you wanting to have a gun in your home um, doesn't seem problematic, right? Uh-huh. Right. Okay. I think having it around emotional people is irresponsible. Right. So, okay, so you're, ma you're making a rational decision. And it's actually quite interesting. The, um, you know, the rate of gun ownership is falling. Um, and though the impression that people have, well, and so is our rate of, um, of gun deaths has fallen. Um, but the impression people have is that things are getting so much worse, that crime is getting worse. And crime is actually significantly better um, in many ways than it was in the early 90s. Um, though we have this impression, I think much of it is the media, that we, we're seeing all this violence all the time. And so that's the view that we have, that things are bad and I need a gun. Um, though. Well, people seem to think that they're bad. Fewer people are buying guns. Um, and for good reason, like yourself, making a rational decision for yourself that that would be, um, that would be more dangerous for you and your family to have one in the home. Um, the estimates are really clear that having a gun in the house makes um, the risk of suicide in the home at least twice as bad um, and perhaps up to 10 times as bad. So just the fact that it's there, um, it gives access to a depressed person that maybe, you know, in a poor moment um, makes, a bad, um, makes a bad call. So I think, um, you know, there are, a lot of, there are a lot of things going on in your question and I'm not sure, in your questions, and I'm not sure if I answered them, but I do think there's a lot of misinformation out there. And it's why it's important to have these kind of discussions to make sure that we're actually really having an informed discussion um, and doing so in a productive way. So. Indeed, um, every study demonstrates that people who keep a gun in their home are much more likely to experience gun-related crime than people who do not keep guns in the home. Your physical proximity is just simply much greater to a tool of violence and death, right? And that has repercussions. <sighs> Despite the rhetoric, right, that's, you know, or the, the holding a gun creates an illusion of security and stability, right? And it might actually create a high degree of security, a security and stability for law enforcement officers and people in the military, right? But it requires a lot of training and dedication and discipline, right? It doesn't necessarily come with just the ability to access a gun. It certainly comes with an inflated sense of self-esteem and power and the illusion of security, right? But that's about as far as it goes. And the statistics will bear that out. To the earlier part of your question, Toronto gets the exact same movies, television, and video games as Chicago, All right? Toronto every year has roughly a dozen, you know, gun deaths. The city of Chicago ha will have hundreds. They have the same... 500 this year almost. Yeah. They have, year. Thank you. And, and uh, they have this, those two cities, right? They have similar populations, right? They have similar socioeconomic, you know, religious and ethnic diversity. They're very similar. Right? The, really, the difference between them right, in terms of gun death is profound, but it has nothing to do with the media. If you take a look, for example, at the political violence 
Uh, there is not a single war between two states going on right now in the world. There are no two states fighting war against each other right now. Nothing. If you look at uh, uh, civil wars, which is the dominant form of conflict in the contemporary world, the number of the civil wars and the deaths is the lowest in the past 50 years. Uh, so uh, we somehow, through our human history, are sort of progressing towards somehow creating a social order. Does it mean that we will not soon have a war, two major wars, I mean major war between two countries? There is a possibility, Israel and Iran, the United States and Iran. Right? But uh, this absence of war and this decreasing, uh, decreasing violence in civil conflicts has been going on for the past, I would say, 25 years. So there is some hope that it will go on linearly. Anyone else? Okay. You guys need to sit closer together. The first speaker asked something about interpreting the Second Amendment, right? Now, wouldn't that, to interpret it would mean to understand what the writers meant by writing it. But I feel like uh, Alexander Hamilton, who was a huge, very significant in writing that, said himself that the Constitution shall never be construed to um, stop peaceable citizens from bearing arms. I guess that's just a simplistic way of thinking about it, but I guess, I mean, what do you think about that? I want to pause for a minute to organize a thought around that. To stop peaceful citizens from bearing arms. Okay. That's what it says, right? Um, also, it says well-regulated militia, right? As my colleague said, you know, the focus on regulation. But, yeah, it says arms. It doesn't say guns. It says arms. And this in Sounds itself good. is significant, right? And of course, at the time that this was written, the most popular arm that would have been found within potential militia members' home was a smooth bore black powder musket, not an AR-15, okay, not a Breda 92, not a Glock 17. You know, times have changed. Regulation, right, changes with that. Arms are regulated in this country, okay? Guns, not so much, but certainly arms are. Right? I can own a gun as a citizen of this country, but I can't own an Apache attack helicopter, to the best of my knowledge. I can't own a bazooka. I can't own weaponized anthrax. Okay? Regulation of arms right, is implied in the language of that. And I, that would be my, my thinking on the issue. Thanks for a good question. For the second guy, um, you said something about the, it's not the root of the problem. It's basically a means of carrying out the violence. So wouldn't you say that's kind of a temporary fix for a permanent problem to take away the guns from these people who are already violent? Well, I, I guess in terms of some of the, the discussion around it, and you know, I, I would sort of lead towards um, where you're going with the question, but um, one of the arguments is if we regulate it and a lot of gun crimes are caused by people that have illegal weapons, then that really doesn't solve that particular problem, that particular point, which is absolutely true. Um, and so that's why I, I'm particularly um, interested in that we direct a lot of attention towards, again, what are the underlying causal factors that, that lead to violence in the first place. That's one direction to, to work at it. With that said, um, and, and I'm going to basically reiterate the, the American Anthropological Association's statement on this issue as well, is that we need a, a tremendous amount of research to figure that out. And partly that's gone along with um, the politicizing of this debate has been really the restriction of, of a of accomplishing a great deal of, of research surrounding this. So it's, um, the concern then is that um, it's illegal individuals that, that are uh, holding guns that are the ones um, sort of, of committing a lot of crimes and that um, regulating a, a law-abiding citizen for doing so isn't going to cause any problems. Um, with that said, we have no really idea of a lot of the supply that, that um, those types of weapons end up in, in hands that they're going to be used in, in very violent conflicts. Uh, we can trace uh, guns back to the um, source of purchase, but we really have uh, comparatively little information in terms of the channels that it goes from the point of purchase to end up in an individual's hand. Um, and so I would like to see a great deal more focus on that. So if we're going to deal with this issue, um, 
One approach would be to regulate all guns, such as taking Australia's approach where we ban all weapons, and that, in a complete totalitarian sense, has some degree of, of work on that. That is probably politically not feasible in America and really not culturally not feasible in America. So with that said, we need to work on addressing the, the root causes of, of violences, and that will uh, help create this trend towards less and less gun um, deaths. And I think that's what we've been doing policy-wide for a great deal of time, and as, as Lisa pointed out, that those have been declining. Um, yet if we really want to be effective about this, if we combine very small, smart policy that really restricts what types of weapons individuals have, and um, does really everybody need an assault rifle, or can we regulate to the point where everybody has a, a sort of a still a legitimate or regulated access to arms? And we're really working on an issue from both directions, and that might, uh, without stepping on everybody's toes and completely um, sort of, of abolishing a, a Second Amendment right, you can still get at a, a peaceable solution that we can um, more effectively decline uh, violences. Um, that's probably the best answer I have for you in that regard. But. Okay. Okay, balance of power. Large central government, power corrupts. Why should we trust the government and give, our def give up our defenses? Go ask anybody from Sudan what the value of a strong central government is. That's my answer. <laughs> Can I ask you, why wouldn't you trust the government? Again, I'll keep it short. Uh, some of us have been, you know, we've all been around, some of us have been around a long time. Um, I've had personal experiences where I've seen how ugly human nature gets, especially where they have more authority than they should. Um, we'd like to think that the problem is the bigger government gets, the less we can see. And human nature being what it is, you know, I believe what people do and say, I see a lot of things that scare me, and I know, you know, other people will think I'm crazy for thinking that, but I think it's prudent to keep your eyes open. Um, Thomas Jefferson had all the trees cut down between his monument and the White House because he didn't trust human nature. I, I can't, I'm not on the panel, but can I answer? <laughs> I teach U.S. history here, so I'm curious about the conversation surrounding the Founding Fathers. You guys realize that if the Founding Fathers walked into this room and looked around and saw us having this conversation about whether we should all have guns, they would say, first of all, most of you shouldn't be allowed in an educational institution. Many of you are not human beings, and you don't deserve any rights, let alone the right to own a gun. And if I'm concerned about the person in the White House, it's because I'm equal to that person, but you are not equal to me. So. You need to be careful about trying to project the past into the present, just like we need to be careful about projecting the present into the past. And the Founding Fathers, that's a tricky conversation all the time. That would be my, my two cents. This might be more of a comment than a question, but it seems to me, I'm very glad that all four of you are presenting all of your perspectives because it tears down this huge cyclical issue that we constantly go through. We want to make change, but we have the political uh, resistance. We have the media that that's just thriving on making, making all of us angry with each other and perpetuating all the conflict that we feel about everything, not just this issue. But I guess in evaluating what each of you have said, you, you have to zone in and find one starting point if this is what, if your goal is to, is to decrease gun violence. And I think that the only way to do this, I think the only thing that the majority of the political spectrum and the cultural spectrum and the economic spectrum agree on is that, is that these semi-automatic weapons are not necessary to have for a personal reason. So I think that that perhaps that's where we ought to be starting. Because you can't, you know, Dylan, you said that you don't have statistics. Well, you can't get statistics unless you have an action that creates a change that you can measure. So unless you segregate these killer guns and take them back, once you do that, you can start segregating you can look at the people who have them who shouldn't have them and sort of segregate that population and focus on that. And in the meantime, that, that is a positive that, that I, I won't even say that everyone can agree on because I don't think, I think we're all incorrigible in the United States. We want our freedom, but we want to regulate what everybody else does. And I think that's at the heart of the issue. So I don't know if you have a comment on the feasibility. 
politically and socially of actually making policy to get those semi-automatic weapons Again, away. that's kind of at, right at the end of my, uh, my little segment is I talked about the, the difference between a top-down approach and a bottom-up approach is that um, whenever you're going to have episodes of local level resistance, and I think in this issue, however you shake the dice, you're going to have tremendous resistance on it, is, is they generally will, will end up failing pretty miserably in that regard. Um, and so a lot of the attention is, is focusing on um, semi-automatic assault rifles themselves, even though um, most of, of gun violence themselves are created by handguns. Um, and so it really becomes a very, very uh, sort of secondary issue in that regard. Um, so, you know, should we, we ban all assault rifles or should we simply just sort of create a, um, a layer of, or having an understanding of, of who's actually having access to them um, or creating some degree of, of making it a more well-regulated thing? Um, that becomes a, sort of a, a debatable issue. If, if I want one thing to focus on, um, what I want to do is I want to decrease barriers between communities because um, that's ultimately going to be um, sort of what's keeping um, the discussion from moving forward in a, a, a productive manner. And that's also what um, are, is, in my, my regard, is se several of the underlying factors that, that lead to individuals um, sort of, of delving themselves into to social and cultural conditions that, that will lead to uh, the violent responses. If everybody has um, a greater degree of, of being able to move across those types of, of boundaries, then um, there tends to be a greater sense of, of unity, and then if there's a greater sense of unity, then um, you have the much more of a, a, an overall political will to, to do things necessary as a, a community. That seems to me idealistic, but um, I think on the ground, uh, sort of picking and choosing one area of, well, we're just going to focus on this, and that's going to take care of it. We've already attempted that once with the assault rifle ban, and it really didn't solve any of the underlying problems. Um, a handgun ban technically would be the much more effective approach but then you get to the problem of you're going to have way too much resistance against that type of thing that make it any sites of, of politically or culturally feasible. So then now you're in a, a stuck position um, of what to do. And so um, I think if we table that kind of side and let politics focus on the symbolism of, symbolism of passing laws and doing that kind of stuff, but instead focus on what at a community level are we able to do to, to decrease violence between ourselves and our neighbors. That's kind of one of the points that Dr. Connor made right at the end is um, the best way to stop a, a, a potential mass murder is to talk to them and include them and break down those boundaries. Um, and that ultimately will, will deal with that issue on a, a ground up approach. So I think everybody has an individual responsibility to, to do that. And that would be irrespective of, of banning a single gun in that regard. Professor Prusik, I was wondering if um, in your research around... I was around going to say something. Oh, pardon no. me. Well, you go right ahead. <laughs> no, go ahead. Uh, new question then. So I was curious in your research on Australia if there was any um, corollaries parlayed with the reduction in homicide to the stricter enforcement, stricter laws, um, in punishment seen to completion. Was there any related suggestion that the, it's not just the guns, but it might be the consequences of, mm -hmm. of behavior that was inappropriate. Yes, you have to understand that the United States has by far the highest rate of gun violence uh, among the developed countries. Right? It also has by far the highest uh, rate of gun ownership among developed countries. There are 300 million people in the United States, a little bit more, 310, and there are around 300 million weapons in the United States. So, in average, every person owns a gun, even a child. Right? Uh, in Germany, for example, Germany has 85 million people, only 5 million guns. Right? In Australia, only 20% of the households right now after the law have guns. Right? Why is that? <laughs> what is driving that notion? Right? I think if you look at some correlations, especially economic correlation, uh, one of the things I tend to look at is income distribution. Uh, income distribution is basically uh, the, the difference between the haves and have nots in this country, the gap between the two groups is by far the deepest and most extensive than in any other developed country in the world. Right? So uh, the communitarian spirit, uh, the spirit of the government that puts people together, right? the basically uh, social contract in which people feel social responsibility towards each other, right? uh, 
one of the biggest questions in many Scandinavian countries which pride themselves on the communitarian spirit is, uh, what do we owe to each other, right? Not what do I owe to myself, right? I think these are the causes that not only in Australia, but in other developed countries uh, basically correlate with much lower levels, much lower rates of gun violence, right? in addition to the absence, to, in addition to the absence of gun society. However, uh, there is a structure of political system in the United States also that prevents any meaningful law for gun control from being passed. Right? So if you look at now Republican, uh, the House of Representatives of American Congress, which has Republican majority, uh, obviously Republicans in majority, I would say almost all of them, are against any stricter gun laws. Right? Uh, when these Republicans in the House of Representatives look at their districts at home, their districts are not really competitive. They do not have a legitimate democratic opponent. The only people these Republican representatives are afraid of are Republicans who are more, even more extreme than they are. Right? So in, political dis in Republican political districts, right, Republicans are not afraid of potential democratic challenger but they're afraid of somebody who is going to be even more extreme on social and economic issue than they are, right? So that basically, in terms of passing the, the uh, stricter gun laws, as Penny uh, wanted to know, uh, that basically makes it almost impossible for some kind of an agreement to be reached between Democrats and Republicans in the, in the House. The same is uh, with Democratic district. The Democratic district, uh, are also uh, structured in such a way because of so-called gerrymandering that they are not competitive at all. So there is no political incentive for any politicians in Congress to compromise with each other because they are not afraid of uh, a challenge from the opposing party. They are afraid of the primary challenge from their own party. And thus, we are stuck in a limbo. I think the only way in which we can solve that is the creation of more than two political parties. Because if we had more than two political parties, then in order for the politicians to be elected, they would have to compromise. So the extremist politics on both sides would basically become milder. It will alleviate itself. But in order for us to have more than two political parties in Congress, we would have to change the electoral system from, some, from the winner-take-all system in political district to some kind of proportional system where every party that gets more than, let's say, 5% of the votes gets into the Congress. So instead of just having two major parties in Congress that are not capable of compromising because they do not have real opponents from the other party, right, they would have to compromise. And then we would have much easier path to more restrictive gun laws, then they would, we would have much less extremist rhetoric from both sides. Right? Then we would be able to come together much better as a society. Because most Americans, in terms of social issues, in terms of economic issues, are somewhere in the middle. They're not uh, extreme on either side. But they vote for extremists on either side because they don't have a choice. What if we give them a choice? What if they give them a choice? Then the compromise would just, I mean, this extremism could melt. That's what the European countries did, right? All European countries and most of other countries in the world that have democratic elections have proportional parliamentary system where more than two political parties basically are in their representative bodies. And in order to form a functioning government, political parties have to create coalitions. And in order to create coalitions, they are forced to compromise in order to survive. Political parties in the United States are not forced to compromise in order to survive. Therefore, there is no compromise. Therefore, there is no agreement. Therefore, we have prevalence of extremist positions. I do think one thing we have to acknowledge is the reason for the extremist positions on this issue has everything to do with money and the influence of the NRA in elections. Um, and so how can we counteract that? Well, 
all we have is our votes, right? Um, and, um, and that doesn't mean that we might not agree with the NRA on some positions. Um, but I do think it's important for us to actually look at these issues honestly um, and acknowledge that there are trade-offs, right? So we've got a trade-off here. We can have um, more safety or we can have as much freedom as we want with owning whatever kind of weapons we want, right? And as we get, um, as we take away weapons, we can get more safety, or as we give people more freedom to get more weapons, we're gonna lose some safety, right? Um, so acknowledging these trade-offs and acknowledging that there will be a loss um, of any sort of policy helps us to start having this conversation. And I get very nervous when um, people start saying, um, but be afraid of the government or, um, you know, or they're gonna take away our weapons. No one is actually suggesting that anyone take away any weapons. This was a very dramatic thing in Australia that I think um, Professor Vrucic, Vrucic very clearly said cannot happen here. And it gave a lot of reasons why this would never happen here. Um, so the question then is what will? Right. Um, what could happen here? Um, something, you know, over, I believe it's over 90% of people think universal background checks when we get a weapon makes sense. Right. Um, right now, the NRA is against that, which means no Republicans in Congress will vote for that. But if 90% of the people in the United States actually think that that makes sense, as we weigh our safety versus freedom, saying, wait a second, that won't take away a weapon from me, so that's not a big cost, but it might help. Um, maybe that sort of thing makes sense, but it really takes us being informed enough to be able to actually start to influence our, um, our lawmakers. Yeah, well, I think, well, the United States has quite a few issues beyond just guns. And, you know, uh, right now, well, I just want to make a couple of comments. I got, I got hit by a drunk driver in 2005. Uh, the guy went off the road and killed my best dog on purpose. And then his cop buddy showed up an hour late and filled out a fault police report for him, of which I went to two attorney generals and complained about and got nowhere. Uh, I've been hunting my whole life. My, my dog that got killed was a hunting dog. When I hunt, I like a 16 gauge side by side. That's two shots. Uh, I don't need an assault rifle. I don't need anything fancy. Um, you can't, it, 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 people get this stuff and they think, oh, well, if the government does something to me, we're just gonna fight back. Well, no, you're gonna get plowed. <laughs> you can't win a fight with the government because the government has the military that will take out probably any, I don't think there's a country in the world that could touch the, the, the American military. With the, with the technology that we have, they, there's no way. It wouldn't even, even be the military. But uh, it, I guess what I'm trying to say is, uh, in my opinion, there's no such thing as gun violence because guns can't commit violence. People commit violence. So therefore, there is violence with guns. It's kind of sad the President of the United States actually mentioned gun violence, like he thought guns commit, were committing violence. That it, there's, a, there's a subliminal thing when you say guns first and then violence, where it should be violence with guns. But uh, uh, there, there, there's a lot of issues in the United States, you know, uh, like uh, all the Alaskan oil pipeline. That pretty much goes right to Japan. <laughs> there's issues. Yeah. There are issues. Does anybody want to answer that? address it just very briefly in america people use guns to kill other people this is what is meant by the phrase gun violence i think that's what our president was referring to right americans use guns to kill other americans to the tune of thousands and thousands of people every year i think we're all pretty clear on what that means and why we're here all right we'll do one more question Kind of playing off what this gentleman was talking about, uh, Professor Hendershot, you mentioned that in Toronto versus Chicago, there's a huge difference in violence, even though there's similar media. Why is that? What culturally is so different that causes this gun violence? to make a joke, but I lived in Canada for two years, but the Canadian semantic domain is hockey, not gun speak. In the interest of connecting these three nights, which was our intention to begin with when we started this,
Last night, Dr. Connor presented some fascinating information about the very fact that the presence of a weapon actually increases